Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Banco Court. Uh, I'll start by acknowledging the traditional owners, um, the first owners of the land where we are, and uh, also in Sydney, where those, um, uh, the other speakers and uh, other participants are joining us from. Um, here in Brisbane, the Turrbal people and the Yagara people, and pay my respects to their ancestors and elders uh, for their wisdom and leadership. The event tonight is jointly hosted by the Australian Academy of Law and the Selden Society. The Australian Academy of Law is a broadly based non-government body comprised of individuals from all parts of the legal community. Its fellows work together for the advancement of the discipline of law. The Academy seeks to promote the highest standards of legal scholarship, education, legal practice and the administration of justice. The Selden Society was founded in 1887 to encourage the study and to advance the knowledge of the history of English law. The Society's connection to Australia began with Sir Samuel Griffith QC, who was one of the members of the founding council. Its activities in Australia are supported by the Supreme Court Library Queensland with Selden Lectures, of which this is the second for this year. The topic for this evening, defamation law, reconciles the right to reputation with freedom of speech. As a barrister and judge, the Honourable Michael McHugh, AC, KC, shaped modern Australian defamation law. We regret, regret that one of our speakers, Professor David Rolfe, has become ill and is confined to his home in Sydney. We had very much been looking forward to him joining us here in the Banco Court in Brisbane. Uh, we wish Professor Rolfe a speedy recovery and very grateful thanks to uh, Mr McHugh and Justice Applegarth who are um, continuing and, uh, and will try to fill the role um, that Professor Rolfe would have taken. Justice Applegarth is here uh, in Brisbane, of course, and he will uh, begin by discussing some of the leading cases from Mr McHugh's illustrious career and the broader issues that they raise. Mr McHugh, who is in Sydney, will then be invited to comment on these cases and his experience as a leading defamation lawyer. Both speakers have asked me not to introduce them. Their careers and works are summarised in the material that you've seen about this event and their reputations precede them. So, Justice Applegarth, I'll invite to give you a quick introduction to the law of defamation that applied when Mr McHugh started at the bar in the early 1960s. Thank you, Chief Justice. I join in the acknowledgement of country. Uh, Australian defamation law uh, came out on the boat from England. Uh, the English law of libel and slander that arrived here was complex. It was derived from many sources, ecclesiastical courts, royal courts and local courts that provided a remedy uh, against insults and an alternative to duelling as a means of protecting honour and avoiding public disorder. Then, as now, the actionable wrong of defamation was a, a tort of strict liability moderated by defences, boiled down to its essentials, it's the three Ds. Is the publication defamatory? Is it defensible? If not, what damages? Civil and criminal defamation cases were heard in the very early years of the colony of New South Wales. Professor Rolfe has written that in less than uh, a few decades after self-government was attained in 1823, New South Wales began to develop its own distinctive defamation law. Laws were passed that abolished the distinction between libel and slander. Uh, an 1847 Act introduced a defence of unlikelihood of harm. We uh, always called it the triviality defence, which was exported uh, around Australia. With the enactment in 2021 of a new threshold of serious harm, uh, as part of the cause of action and defamation, the triviality defence was repealed. Returning to the 19th century, truth alone was not uh, a defence in New South Wales after 1847. A defendant also had to prove that the publication was for the public benefit. We had such a defence in Queensland until 2006. Until 2006, New South Wales also had uh, a public interest element in its defence of justification. Unlike common law states like Victoria, where truth alone was a, a defence, there was an additional uh, public interest uh, element. Uh, and that element uh, served to protect, to some extent, uh, interests uh, in privacy. 
Uh, in Queensland, the brilliant lawyer and codifier, Sir Samuel Griffith, drafted uh, a code in 1889, and he gave a powerful uh, le law lecture to the parliament when he introduced his own piece of legislation. Uh, that code defined what was defamatory uh, and included a raft of defences, uh, like fair report, fair comment, and some broad qualified privilege defences to protect the discussion in good faith of matters of public interest. We'll return to those public interest or qualified privilege defences in the second half of this evening's uh, event. By 1958, New South Wales defamation law contained many statutory modifications to the common law. That state uh, introduced uh, in their place the Griffith Code, but it was not a success. It was replaced in 1974 by a new act that was comprehensive, but not a code, uh, and that built on the common law. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, Sydney juries awarded some successful plaintiffs very substantial damages for defamation. They included Harry Hopman, uh, uh, Mr Kornhauser, and most famously, Tom Uren uh, MP, uh, who sued the Packer Press uh, and was awarded damages uh, of £30,000. That was a spectacularly large amount uh, at the time. It could have bought you a very nice uh, house by the harbour. Uh, back in the early 1960s. Uh, UN's counsel at trial and in the High Court and in the Privy Council where he managed to hold onto that uh, large award was Clive Evatt QC, the brother of Doc Evatt. As a junior barrister in the 1960s, Mr McHugh had a broad practice that included many years of civil law, criminal law and labour law. He often was junior to the legendary advocate Jack Smythe. Mr McHugh developed a substantial defamation practice and was influenced by Clive Evatt QC, uh, with whom he often appeared as junior on behalf of plaintiffs. The Australian Dictionary of Biography refers to Evatt's superb oratorical skills and tactical ability that gave him a commanding presence over a jury. Uh, Mr McHugh, one of the topics that interests us is the diminishing role of the jury in recent decades in defamation litigation in state courts and its complete absence uh, from cases that are increasingly tried in the federal court. Before we discuss some specific cases that you were involved in and that involved juries, can you share your experience as a junior in the 1960s in doing trials before juries and the great jury advocates who you observed what made them so effective? Well, well thank you, Judge. Uh, I hope everyone will excuse my voice. Uh, as you've just been told, Professor Rolf had to, uh, has got the flu, and there seems to be a lot of it travelling around in Sydney, and I'm afraid in the last uh, 24 hours or so, uh, I've got a very heavy cold, so uh, I hope you'll forgive me if uh, I'm not as clear as I ought to be. But the two great advocates um, in defamation cases uh, when I was a junior was Clive Everett QC and Jack Smythe QC. Now, Everett mesmerised juries. He had a mellifluous voice, he talked simply and clearly to juries, and he was very witty. Uh, and he, Frequently, in the course of his addresses, he would uh, have the jury in fits of laughter, particularly when he was criticising the case of the uh, defendant publisher. Uh, in the case of uh, Finninger against John Fairfax, uh, where Finninger was known as Madame Lash, uh, she was a dominant trick who whipped people and went under the name Madame Lash. And uh, in the course of uh, that trial, I remember uh, Clive Everett saying to the jury, members of the jury, all she wants is a fair crack of the whip. <laughs> and, uh, 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 he, Clive had a great memory, and he conducted cases without a note. Uh, in a personal injury case, I once saw him uh, Address the jury for two and a half days without uh, a 
note. Uh, but he was a great tactician, and he had an unerring instinct uh, for the argument that would most appeal to juries. Uh, and there's no better example of that than in the Waite defamation case. Waite was a bookmaker who had been banned for life because he had bet heavily against two greyhounds who uh, had allegedly been doped. Uh, Waite's uh, defence was a simple one. He said, look, um, Harrigan was the leading bookmaker. Uh, he was laying these dogs. I thought there must be something wrong with them, that they filed badly or something. Uh, so I just followed him. I had nothing whatever to do with the doping. So when, when Evans said to me, what's our case? I said, well, it's a very simple case. Uh, uh, Wake had nothing to do with it. He just followed uh, Harrigan, the leading bookmaker. And he said to me, no, that's not our case. He said, our case is these dogs weren't doped. He said, they'll never be able to prove it. And he was right. And so he was able to go to the jury, thundering, look, it's Fairfax and these other newspapers published for days allegations that Wake was involved in the doping of these dogs, and they weren't doped at all. And the jury brought in a verdict for $150,000 which was equivalent to well over a million dollars today. And that was a real illustration of how he could pick a weakness uh, in a case. Um, he also had what he used to call court craft. And he knew the weaknesses of judges and what they, what they um, were likely to do. Um, in New South Wales in those days, you, you could apply for a 12-person jury to hear defamation cases. And he said to me, as his junior, always apply for a 12-person jury. I said, why, Clive? He said, because 12-person juries can only be heard in number two and number three courts. And the judges who preside in those courts, Maguire and Collins, uh, favour protection of reputation over freedom of speech. And you always get a better run in, the, in those two courts. But that was the way he, 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 he thought. Uh, he said to me about another judge, uh, if it's very important to get the judge to correct something he said in the summing up, uh, always ask for the jury to go out because this judge is so vain he cannot bring himself in front of a jury to <laughs> concede error. And it was that sort of thinking, uh, practical things as, a, as an advocate, which played an important part of his, his success. Mr. He was also very, very smart. And intellectually, I, I doubt if he was inferior to Dr. Evert. Uh, in, in, in intelligence, in, in intellect. Now, Jack Smythe was a, was a different <coughs> advocate. Uh, he was a great all-rounder. He was equally at home at arguing a constitutional case in the High Court like Airlines of New South Wales and New South Wales, uh, running a murder trial uh, or uh, running a patent case. He, he was a great, great all-rounder. He was also, uh, in my view, he was the best barrister I ever saw or ever expect to see. Uh, he was a, uh, an amazing cross-examiner. Uh, uh, some of his cross-examinations were just absolutely fantastic. He led me in a criminal case once, and it wasn't a, it was a fairly strong criminal case. But his, his cross-examination so destroyed the, the, the Crown case that the jury brought in a, a verdict in favour of the, of the defendant. And then occurred a scene I've never seen before or ever expect to see again. The jury, when they were discharged, instead of going out the door, came down out of the jury box, surrounded Smythe, and congratulated him on his conduct of, of, of the case. 
Uh, that gives you some idea of, of how he was. Uh, he, although he was a great cross-examiner, he, he believed that you use cross-examination to build your own case rather than destroy <coughs> um, <coughs> the other side's case. I might just ask a, a follow-up question. Uh, Tommy Wren's uh, litigation with the Packer Press and the Fairfax Press lasted from 1963 until 1969 when Sir Frank Packer actually wrote a cheque that Uren photographed before banking it. Um, in his autobiography, Mr Uren wrote that Clive Everett QC was a magnificent lawyer in front of a jury, that Mr. U but that uh, Mr Uren was always worried uh, about what he described as Everett's combative approach in arguing points of law in front of appellate judges. Uh, he wrote, quote, when Michael McHugh finally joined Everett as his junior, I became more secure about our case being argued in front of the appeal courts. How did you and Clive Everett work together as a team? Well, um, from a very early stage in our uh, association, he let me argue all the legal points in, in the case. And uh, of course, it was a tremendous help to my reputation. Uh, cases that uh, Everett was in attracted a large public following and uh, it could do me no harm for this great man to be sitting at, alongside me at the bar table while I got up and argued the legal points in the case. So I owe him a lot uh, in, in that respect. But uh, he was a very inefficient user of, of time. Uh, he, he wanted to talk anecdotally about his time in Parliament and about other 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 people. Uh, so at the end, I used to simply go to him and I'd say, Clive, uh, look, I want to put this argument. Now, I need these facts. Uh, I want you to prove these facts. And that was the way we way we worked. But uh, he always let me argue. I, I mean, uh, uh, the case, I remember, <coughs> in a, in a, in a special lead application in the, in the High Court Lang against Australian Consolidated Press, uh, Sir Garfield Barwick and Sir Douglas Menzies were much amused when he announced, Ever announced our appearances and then said to them, Mr. McHugh will argue this. So, you know, and um, Barwick was, in particular, was much, much amused by, by that. But uh, I had a great working relationship with him. Uh, in that sense, and I had a great working relationship with Smythe. I learned a great deal from, from Smythe, but more so, I think, than from, 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 from Everett. Can, can we move to the 1958 Act? Uh, one of your contemporaries at the junior bar was David Hunt, uh, who was a leading defamation practitioner and a great judge and a specialist in defamation law. He told me, uh, when I spoke to him in the early 1980s, that when he was a junior, in the 1960s, media defendants who'd been stung by large jury awards uh, would engage counsel like him to challenge pleadings and if they could stop proceedings from uh, getting anywhere near uh, a jury. And he and others uh, created a great deal of case law on the technicalities of pleading and the intricacies of the Griffith Code. Uh, by 1974 in Field and John Fairfax, the New South Wales Court of Appeal observed that it was, quote, almost beyond human capacity, unquote, for a trial judge in New South Wales to direct a jury on the issues without falling into error. In a 1981 case, Justice Hunt reflected on the 16 turbulent years of life of the 1958 New South Wales Code. May I ask you, why do you think the Griffith Code became unworkable in New South Wales? Well, well it was a mystery to me. Uh, it may be because uh, uh, the Act was brought in in 58 and I came to the bar in 61, so it was all I ever knew. I thought the Griffith Code worked well. It was easy to understand, but uh, and older practitioners and judges didn't like it. And in, uh, in particular, they disliked the, the definition of defamatory matter 
which the Act defined as the defamatory imputation. And they disliked the idea that you had to prove the uh, defamatory imputation was true or was fair comment. Uh, rather than proving the facts in the article were true or that the opinion in the article was 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 fair. <coughs> that, <coughs> that was a, a, a fairly widely held view. And indeed, if you look at Justice Kirby's judgment in uh, Rifkin and John Fairfax, uh, you'll see that he uh, criticises this notion of having to prove the uh, defamatory imputation. But as far as I was concerned, uh, I mean, uh, maybe the, the act was just second nature to me. Uh, I, didn't, I, I thought it worked very well, better than the common law. So yeah. I'm interested in Samuel Gifford's comment on, on, on that. Well, you're, but, talk, you're talking uh, to a Queensland audience, so you're in good company, I think. Um, <laughs> Uh, can we move then to one of uh, your cases, Andrews and John Fairfax, 1982, New South Wales Law Reports 225. Uh, uh, that went to trial in 1979. You acted for Mr Andrews and his company. He was a distinguished uh, architect. Uh, he and his company sued the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, the Melbourne Herald and the Brisbane Telegraph, who was represented by Tony Fitzgerald uh, at the trial over similar articles. The articles didn't name Mr Andrews or his company, but they referred to a government building that leaked. He complained that these things are imputed, to use the language of the 1974 Act in New South Wales, that they imputed that he was negligent and incompetent. The defendants dropped qualified privilege defences and contextual truth defences close to trial. And so the issue for the jury was general damages for damage to reputation and loss of business. The a jury at Mr McHugh's encouragement uh, awarded a record total sum of $480,000. Uh, on appeal, the company retained its general damages of $180,000, but the award of $300,000 to Mr Andrews, uh, which was described by uh, Justice of Appeal Hutley uh, as a spectacular vindication, was found to be excessive and a retrial was ordered uh, on damages for Mr Andrews. Uh, and the matter settled before uh, a retrial. These days, uh, when there's a jury in a defamation case in Australia, the um, jury doesn't assess damages. Uh, reflecting on your uh, experience in defamation trials, are there any benefits in your view in having a jury assess damages as opposed to a judge? Were juries as bad at assessing damages for defamation as the high-profile cases of manifestly excessive damages might suggest? Well, I've got to say, I'm in the jury's corner. I, I think ju juries are generally better at valuing damages claims. Uh, an experience when I was a judge in the Court of Appeal drove that home to me. <coughs> when I went on the Court of Appeal, there were a number of appeals against the inadequacy of jury verdicts, and I led the court in having those verdicts set aside. But uh, quite a number of them came up, and it suddenly dawned on me that I, as a judge, who'd come from, a, let's say, a comfortable background, uh, earning uh, a considerable amount of money, uh, saw damages in a very different light to the way that the ordinary a member of the, the public saw it. And it was a big lesson for me um, that uh, uh, from then on I was very, very cautious about interfering with uh, juries, juries' verdicts. Um, juries, um, well, I'm afraid I've not. I've found in whenever I've been involved with any group of people uh, that the decision of the body as a whole is better than the contribution of any individual. And so I think it applies to judges. I, I think the jury of 12 
uh, is likely to be get a better result than a jury of uh, than a, uh, a court of three or four. Before so, before we leave the uh, Andrews case, it's worth noting that under current law, um, Mr Andrews' company would not be entitled to recover the damages that it did for defamation uh, if it uh, employed 10 or more people. Such a company has no cause of action under uh, Australian law for defamation and corporations presumptively have not been able to for almost uh, two decades unless they have less than 10 employees. Do you have a, a view about the restriction on those for profit corporations I with say, 10 or I more people having no do. cause of action? And, and, and the recent experience of the Dominion case in the United States shows um, how important it is that uh, corporations should be able to sue for, de for, for, for defamation. Uh, I mean, if, um, if that case was run in Australia, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that, that uh, it, it could succeed here. So, no, it, um, it would ha it'd have to resort to an action for injurious falsehood, of which would need to prove malice. So there is that uh, difference. Uh, the other thing uh, is that under current Australian law and since 2005, Mr Andrews' general damages would be capped uh, by statute. And under that 2005 Act, in the light of the Rebel Wilson case, the Wagner Brothers cases and other cases that interpreted the 2005 Act, that cap uh, did not apply in cases where aggravated damages were uh, awarded. But that situation was reversed in 2021, so there's now a hard cap on general damages, and aggravated damages are now separately uh, assessed. That brings us to uh, a leading case that was decided in the High Court before those caps were introduced. It was Carson and John Fairfax uh, in 1993. Uh, Mr Carson was a very senior solicitor. He was awarded $400,000 over one article $200,000 over uh, another that appeared in the Sydney Morning Herald in 1987 and 1988. They included awards of aggravated damages because of the unjustified conduct of the defendant. The New South Wales Court of Appeal set those uh, verdicts aside as being manifestly uh, excessive on a further appeal to the High Court. Justice McHugh, Justice Brennan uh, and Justice Tui each dissented uh, in the High Court and would have restored the jury's verdict in favour of the plaintiff. The four other High Court judges confirmed that there uh, should be a, a retrial. Uh, Mr McHugh, you didn't think that the awards could be condemned by uh, an appeal court as unreasonable. Uh, and I'll paraphrase here. Uh, you said, because the awards are so much higher than any judge is likely to have awarded, there's a great temptation to think that the amounts are too high to be reasonable. And you went on to note that the Parliament in New South Wales had left it to juries to assess these things, knowing that juries were required to assess damages according to its own good sense uh, and sound instincts as to what was fair uh, and reasonable in all the circumstances. You noted the standing of the plaintiff, the gravity of the defamation, widespread circulation, uh, the conduct of the defendant, not apologising, persisting in defences uh, and the like. Uh, and you uh, said, in all those circumstances, the verdicts, if not inevitable, were on the cards. You went on to say, if these cases were tried again on the same facts, accompanied by the same tactics, it is quite possible that the jury would return similar verdicts. Uh, with respect, that was a very prescient comment because at the retrial, uh, a new jury awarded Mr Carson $1,300,000 and there was another appeal that was settled. Uh, your judgment in um, Carson, if I may say so with respect, is masterful discussion of principles, including the function of uh, aggravated uh, damages. Uh, and people might note that after 1974 in New South Wales, New South Wales law didn't permit exemplary damages. And so Mr Carson's uh, would have to be justified as compensatory, including aggravated compensatory uh, damages. You stated, uh, this is page 105, an award of damages may not properly console the plaintiff who has been the victim of a malicious defamation unless the anguish that the person has suffered is placated by an award which is large enough to deter the defendant from again defaming him or her. 
thus an amount sufficient to deter the defendant from again defending uh, the plaintiff is in many cases a proper uh, element of aggravated compensatory damages. Can I ask you just a couple of questions arising from that? You acted for many uh, plaintiffs when you were at the bar and you understood their motivation uh, in an era in which um, exemplary damages aren't available to punish. What's the proper function of aggravated damages? If they do have a deterrent element, should they be capped by statute? And now that judges, not juries, uh, award damages, how can uh, a, a poor judge like some of us are now in the audience and speaking personally, how can, well, how can we assess what's a proper deterrent effect? Well, um, there's always been an element of, almost of punishment or certainly deterrence in aggravated damages. Um, juries used to award damages in accordance with the views of, of Justice Willis, who was one of the great uh, English judges of the 19th century. Uh, in um, Horsdyke and, and Stone, he said that a jury considers not only what the plaintiff should receive, but what the defendant should pay. Uh, and in Yarim's case, uh, Justice Windia, uh, who built on what Justice Dixon had said in Smith's newspapers in Becker, said that the compensation in a, in a defamation case uh, is a salation rather than a recompense for, for harm measurable in, in, in money. Uh, Justice Windy have pointed out that a punitive element lurks in, in many cases in which the damages were aggravated by the uh, defendant's conduct. And uh, other great common lawyers, Lord Reed, for example, and Lord Hailsham in Broome and Castle, uh, expressed the, the same view. Uh, in Smith's newspapers in Becker, uh, Justice Dixon uh, spoke of, of an award serving uh, uh, as a salation, a vindication, uh, a compensation to the plaintiff, and I think he said a requital uh, to the uh, defendant, uh, to the wrongdoer, I think he said. And, uh, and it was said uh, that, that, that Tennyson said the jingling of the guinea helps the hurt that honour feels. Uh, and you, you wrote in Carson something about, about that, that the plaintiff feels hurt and feels that proper compensation requires the defendant to feel some degree of hurt as well, comparable uh, amount of hurt. Yes, well, uh, Section 36 of the New South Wales... Uh, the 2005 Act states that the courts to disregard malice or other state of mind uh, except to the extent that uh, the malice or other state of mind affects the harm suffered uh, by the plaintiff. So uh, it's pretty easy for a competent counsel to slide around that prohibition about using malice or other state of, state of, state of mind. Um, but, uh, yeah. we, we, we might move on because uh, we've got a lot, lot to cover. I was going to ask you some questions about Rivkin, which you wrote the leading judgment on uh, appellate intervention for perverse jury verdicts. That's where uh, a jury in a 7A trial mucked things up and got imputations horribly wrong. If I could just ask you more about um, to round off this section on, on juries about appellate uh, intervention and noting there's an emerging issue about uh, what should govern uh, appeals from judges sitting alone and deciding whether things are, are defamatory. Uh, in m many cases, UREN is one of them, juries make a finding of malice or, or lack of malice and if they find malice it would defeat a qualified privilege defence. Uh, and so the Madame Lash case was taken away from Clive Evert Senior uh, on appeal when the appeal court said there was insufficient evidence of malice to go to the jury. Uh, in Dominion voting systems and Fox, if that case had gone to trial and resulted in a verdict for Dominion voting systems, then 
one would have expected Fox to uh, appeal uh, and say that the jury uh, should not have found that Fox News acted with actual malice or reckless uh, indifference. So my uh, concluding question for this part of the talk is how rigorous should an appellate court be in reviewing a finding of malice or, for that matter, an absence of malice? Well, uh, in administrative law, it's, uh, it's said that uh, uh, courts should uh, not uh, parse every word of the uh, decisions of administrative tribunals. Uh, they should take a broad view. Uh, and I think the same um, approach should apply to looking at, uh, at uh, jury verdicts. Uh, after all, the legislature has uh, provided for juries to decide these matters and uh, their views ought to, ought to uh, be respected. And, and particularly since uh, I, I believe that uh, juries may well have a different po point of view to um, to the approach of, of, of judges. We so I think that uh, they should be very careful. The public court should be very careful in interfering with jury's verdicts. We might move now to the second part of the program, which deals with public interest and qualified privilege defences. There's a very low threshold at common law on what's defamatory, and uh, given strict liability, that is, one can defame someone irrespective of the degree of care that one takes. Uh, the law in the 19th century developed qualified privilege defences to permit the free flow of information where people in good faith provide information. That was mainly in the context of limited publications where someone's responding to an inquiry about a former employee or reporting something to the police and, and the like. Uh, I won't take time to develop that point, but in the 20th century, mass communications, uh, newspapers, struggled uh, to establish an occasion of qualified privilege at common law to communicate defamatory statements to the general public. But uh, in the code states in Australia, defences were far more protective uh, of communications on matters of public interest. And that was the task faced by plaintiffs like uh, Tom Uren and the trade union leader Pat Mackey to defeat these expansive qualified privilege defences by proving uh, malice. Uh, when Mr McHugh started at the bar in the early 60s, the, New York, uh, the US Supreme Court in New York Times and Sullivan uh, created a new defamation defence, constitutionally based, uh, that required public figures uh, to prove actual malice, and that in, was in play in Dominion voting uh, systems. Uh, so until 1964, American defamation law was remarkably similar to England uh, and Australia in not having expansive uh, general law qualified privilege uh, defences. Uh, the potential of the Griffith Code to protect uh, robust expressions of opinion and communications was evident in Caldwell's case that went to the High Court in 1975, one of Clive Everett's uh, cases that he had a jury verdict taken uh, away from him. In 1974, the 1958 code was replaced by a statute and the new section 22 was intended to simplify those code qualified privilege defences, yet starting with Wright and ABC, that I'll come to shortly, and followed by Morosi and other cases, the New South Wales Court of Appeal narrowly interpreted section 22 and said it required specific attention to the circumstances of the publication, pre-publication conduct, omission of words, phrasing of words, uh, the defendant's belief in the truth of the imputations that were in fact conveyed, and Justice Hunt, later in Morgan and John Fairfax, erected quite a few hoops for uh, any defendant uh, to jump through. Uh, one of Mr McHugh's uh, cases at the bar was Wright against the ABC. Senator Wright came from Tasmania. He uh, alleged that he's indefensibly defamed by Richard Carlton uh, on this day tonight. Uh, and he succeeded at first instance, and the trial judge, Justice Yeldham, uh, made a ruling uh, really interpreting section 22 as the code defences had uh, applied. And he said um, uh, it was proper, uh, well, he didn't think you had to closely examine the uh, material. He ruled 
that there was an occasion of qualified privilege. He thought the occasion was made out if the publication related to broad topics or, or subjects of public interest. Uh, there was no evidence of malice, and so the ABC won at trial. But, uh, and that approach reflected the approach in Cornwall, but the ABC's uh, success was taken away from it uh, on appeal in 1977. Mr McHugh, you acted for the ABC and led David Levine uh, on the appeal uh, in 1977. Well, uh, uh, look, right, right at ABC was, I think, probably the only case where I ever got angry uh, <laughs> during the, the course of a, of a case. Uh, uh, Murray Gleeson appeared for, for Senator Wright at first instance before Justice Yeldon, and uh, uh, I persuaded Justice Yeldon to enter a verdict for the defendant. And uh, when we went to the Court of Appeal, uh, uh, Justice Moffat was the president, and from the moment the appeal started, I, I should say, Senator Wright sacked Murray Gleeson and, and argued it himself. And from the moment the, the appeal started, uh, President Moffat was strongly on his side. When I got to my feet, uh, I was a, everything I said, uh, I don't think I finished a sentence. Uh, I was interrupted th th throughout. And uh, uh, it, 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 the court was, was determined um, to, uh, to, to set aside the verdict, uh, which, 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 they, which they did. Um, so uh, it, it left a bad taste in my mouth that that, that particular particular case. Uh, in fact, I, I don't think I've ever been treated as badly by a court as I had in, or I was in that case. They just weren't interested in anything I had to say. To be perfectly frank about it. Well, um, well that that, sec uh, that section twenty two interpretation was cemented by later cases and. In 1986, you wrote a, an article where you still held out hope that Section 22 may not be as narrow as had been suggested by uh, decisions such as the Privy Council decision in Austin and Mirror Newspapers. The, of course, the publishing environment was very different back then where you had uh, the National Times and uh, investigative reporting and, and the like. Looking back, um, what do you make of the contraction of what, qualified privilege defences through the well, interpretation of section 22? Well, I think there was probably an unconscious assumption uh, that if a defamatory article has one or more errors, it must be uh, or is probably uh, unreasonable. And the courts, particularly the New South Wales courts, uh, gave, seemed to give less weight to the social purpose served by the publication than to any errors it, it contains, particularly where the existence of the errors uh, could or should have been found. Uh, I, I think overall, uh, it might be fair to say that uh, the New South Wales courts uh, tended to favour protection of reputation rather than freedom of, 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 of speech. So section 22 uh, didn't uh, uh, have the effect that uh, I think it should have had and uh, in terms of what was un unreasonable. And I might mention that in Longy's case, uh, after the judgments in Longy, that's the constitutional case of that, um, Freedom of political communication. After the judgments in Longy had been prepared and printed, I became concerned that the narrowness of the New South Wales decisions on Section 22 concerning reasonableness uh, might be used to narrow the scope of the freedom to communicate on political matters. And, uh, uh, I don't think I'm telling any other school by saying that uh, I wanted to add a footnote uh, to that effect, uh, but uh, others uh, thought that uh, it was not appropriate at that late stage to 
over the judgment and the, and the, the point should have waited until it was fully, fully argued. But I regret that I, I didn't really think about the, the, the possibility of those New South Wales decisions uh, on the freedom of communications. And of course, that's what's happened. I mean, Longy has not had the um, effect uh, in favour of, of publishers that uh, I thought it would, uh, would, would have. What's, what's interesting uh, is that the High Court, starting that constitutional cases, the Office of St Stephen's, but then uh, creating a common law uh, category of qualified privilege to government and political matters, went down a certain path uh, and then we had statutes and so there's been very little development of the common law of qualified privilege in Australian law statute seems to dominate and have the longy test uh, over there again with a reasonableness standard. In, in the meantime, uh, starting with Lord Bingham's uh, judgment in the English Court of Appeal in, in Reynolds and Times newspaper upheld uh, on appeal uh, in the House of Lords and then adapted in Canada, New Zealand, other uh, countries. They developed uh, what's called the Reynolds Defence, or what's called the Reynolds Defence at the time, which tended to focus on the circumstances of the publication, but uh, in practice gave more protection uh, than uh, our laws did. And there seemed to be no appetite uh, in, amongst Australian judges to import Reynolds and Times newspapers into Australia. So. The common law seems to have been shut out from further development in relation to communications to the general public, which was something that you thought in your judgment and Stevens should happen. It is. Uh, well, my, my, view, my view about um, freedom of the press uh, changed, I'm afraid, well, I'm not afraid, but did change over, over the years. Uh, in my early days, I was a great believer in the, the view of Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes that the best test of truth uh, was uh, debate in the marketplace, as he, as he said, and uh, people ought to be allowed to put their views strongly, even uh, if some of them were, were wrong. But. Uh, that was those views of mine were formed in a in a in a, a period when the people have now long forgotten. Uh, Kerry Packer said quite correctly, in my view, that the standard of newspapers in Australia went downhill the moment all journalists got a byline, and until. Uh, probably 40 or 50 years ago, uh, the only journalists who got a, a byline were those who were classified as super A's. And uh, they were highly intelligent, very fair-minded, uh, and very balanced writers. writers. And uh, with those sorts of writers, I thought that they ought to be given uh, uh, freedom from being held liable for mistakes. Uh, but uh, as the years have gone by, uh, I mean, the gutter press has come to the fore. Uh, you've only got to see what goes on in certain, in the United States in particular. Um, and um, and of course, with the internet, there were all the trolls and people putting material out on the on the on the internet. Uh, it's uh, it's very difficult to uh, adhere to the views I had when I was a young young uh, um, um, barrister. Well, I, I guess in, um, in in 1975, in Corwell's case, which was on the the Griffith Code. Uh, the High Court spoke eloquently. That was a Mungo McCallum, a cervic attack on uh, Arthur Corwell, and that's a great statement of uh, freedom of speech on government and political matters, but that, as you say, was uh, at a time when 
You had um, Fairfax with the rivers of gold supporting uh, investigative uh, journalism. I suppose uh, if you're on the High Court now or the New South Wales Court of Appeal uh, and you're after a fashion developing the common law or interpreting statutes or developing the longy defence, it's there's a kind of legislative function where you're deciding what the law should be. And on the one hand, the law should protect what remains of responsible journalism, but on the other hand, shouldn't provide a license to defame to um, unethical media outlets. So it, it must be difficult when you're sitting on a final uh, appellate court, you might have a deserving uh, defendant uh, before you, but you've got to think about the implications of granting a New York Times and Sullivan kind of defence to all. How, how do you think the law might reconcile creating uh, a legal environment that protects the best journalism? Well, but, well but I, th I think it's um, it, it's well well set up, set out in that uh, English decision of uh, its name is Lockshare, I think, against Independent Print li Limited and. Uh, the judge in that case uh, set out um, various matters. First of all, you, you had to consider the steps taken to verify the allegations, uh, what efforts were made to contact the plaintiffs, uh, uh, how serious were the imputations, uh, the extent to which the article distinguished between suspicion, uh, mere allegations, or questions of fact. Uh, the uh, need to publish expeditiously uh, uh, and uh, whether or not the matter really uh, or the publication advanced the, the public interest. And if you, you took those matters in, into, into account, uh, then I think you've got some basis for um, extending um, freedom of, of, of ex expression. Of course, it's trying to balance protection of reputation and freedom of expression is practically a hopeless task because they're incommensurable. You just uh, you just can't do it. You just got to make a value judgment uh, and. Um, in, in some situations, you'd come down in favour of freedom of expression and others in protection of rep reputation. So uh, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, and I don't think the law will ever solve it myself. The, um, and I've thought about it. Yeah, I've thought about it a lot for uh, clearly. 50 years. <laughs> uh, the factors that you're referring to there in Lord Nicholls' speech in, in Reynolds. And they found expression in Section 30 of the 2005 Act. Just for our audience, in 2005, we had uniform national uh, laws that picked up effectively Section 22 with a few Reynolds and Times newspapers, feathers uh, attached to it, but incorporated that reasonable standard, which was hard in practice to uh, prove. Uh, and just for a local audience, uh, the Griffith Code defences that the ABC relied upon to defend the Four Corners program, the Moonlight State uh, went. Uh, the code defences that I pleaded with Cedric Hampson um, uh, when some uh, very corrupt police officers sued the newspapers before the Fitzgerald inquiry, they went, but we pleaded them and they were enough to hold the fort until those police officers were found to be corrupt at the Fitzgerald inquiry. So we lost those Griffith uh, defences. Uh, and for the last 20 years, although you have that Reynolds checklist or factors, in section 30, that section hasn't uh, been of any practical use to the media. Uh, I wish Professor Rolf was here because I'll just round off with uh, this topic before asking Mr McHugh to uh, make uh, some concluding remarks. Uh, a lot of us regretted that there wasn't a more robust qualified privilege defence enacted across the country in 2005 uh, and we thought it would be uh, predictable that it wouldn't work for reputable media organisations. Eventually, 20 years later, just about, uh, that deficiency was recognised to an extent by the enactment of 
Section 29, capital letter A of the Defamation Act that came into effect in uh, 2021. And whereas you still have Section 30 that the test is whether the defendant's conduct uh, in making the publication was reasonable in all the circumstances, the new public interest defence shifts the focus uh, to uh, whether uh, the publisher's belief that the publication was in the public interest was reasonable. So the shift is from reasonableness of conduct to the reasonableness of belief. Uh, now, uh, that uh, Section 29A uh, defence was to be tested in uh, Murdoch against Crikey. That's not to be. Uh, but we, it remains to be seen whether that, will, that shift to reasonableness of belief will provide much more protection or the sorts of things that defeat reasonableness of conduct will just be revisited in the guise of saying that the belief was uh, unreasonable. If you want to read more about it, uh, there are many English cases. Uh, I commend to you uh, Gatlin, Libel and Slander, and you can go on the websites of leading English barristers groups like 5RB to acquaint yourself with that law because Section 29A is based on Section 4 of the 2013 uh, English uh, Act. So um, given uh, the time, I'm going to soon seek leave from the Chief Justice to discontinue, uh, as might a plaintiff, um, uh, at least after the defence goes in. Uh, but uh, Mr McHugh, uh, would, would you like to make some further observations about your views? We've discussed juries, we've discussed uh, d defences, uh, some uh, concluding remarks well, about the topics? Well, I think the, the remarks I already made so, express my views about it, at least on paper. Um, the recent amendments uh, seem to extend freedom of ex expression, uh, but um, so much will depend upon the way the courts uh, uh, in, interpreted and uh, um, um, who, who knows if you're dealing with uh, what uh, um, the, the late Professor Stone called categories of indeterminate reference and they really have no meaning uh, until courts or juries give them some some content uh, so uh, well, I, 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 I suppose that raises the issue of who determines these things because one of the great complexities of the 1958 Act and that uh, led to the appeal in Cornwall was whether uh, these questions of whether there's an occasion of qualified privilege and under the statute whether reasonableness is a matter for the judge to decide or the jury to decide. Uh, and at least in Australia where defamation cases are increasingly filed in the federal court, which is a no jury zone, uh, it's judges who are deciding the scope of these defences without input from juries, which uh, I might just ask you this. Back in the old days, plaintiffs used to uh, go to the ACT Supreme Court if they wanted to uh, avoid a jury. That's a well-trod path for Mr Hawke and uh, Sir John Gorton as a Prime Minister and Sir Lennox Hewitt and others. What, what do you think about the role of juries in decide, determining these things of reasonableness uh, and defences? Well, um, in, in uh, many areas of law, um, the question of reasonableness is, is for the jury. So uh, I'm, I'd like to see how it work, work, works out. I, I, um, I think juries would really need some very careful uh, clear directions from judges as to how to, to approach the, the, ta the, the, the task. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, any, anything that it could, it could happen, uh, at least the judges, uh, they set out their reasons, and those reasons can be looked at in subsequent cases and modified, criticised, ex extended. Um, so, I'm a bit wary about giving it to, to uh, juries to determine, notwithstanding my general faith in juries. 
Perhaps I can just conclude the evening with an anecdote that uh, was told me by a, a lawyer, it wasn't Tony Fitzgerald in the uh, Andrews case that you succeeded in. Uh, he told me that, that every morning in front of the jury, you'd go through and correct the previous day's transcript. And this was not something the solicitor was used to, having leading counsel correcting the transcript, which would be done out of court in the absence of the jury during some downtime and the like. Uh, and after you'd won the Andrews case, uh, I think you might have been having uh, a drink with your opponents, and he asked you why you, why you did that, and you said, "Well, you know, the jury hears me saying this is correct, and the judge corrects the the transcript, and so they think that I'm reliable." Um, so, was, was was that a piece of courtcraft that you picked up yourself, or did you uh, learn that one at the feet of Clive Everett? <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, I don't remember. So. <laughs> um, the, the, if you don't remember that, uh, Clive Everett Jr. Uh, once uh, told me that uh, when you came to the bar and uh, started your defamation practice, you introduced a new thing called a new practice where you ex would explain to the jury in your opening that, a bit about the law of defamation. So he credits you with... Um, with doing that, and I saw that to great effect when I was his junior in a case. Was that something you thought was um, important in an opening? Well, uh, it was that openings in, in, in jury cases were very, uh, <coughs> very important because, uh, in, in fact, uh, a lot of advocates would tender the article right at the start before uh, of their, at the commencement of their opening address. So the, I didn't like that. Uh, I used to, I thought that you uh, did better if you could address the jury and, and tell them what the article was about so you put your spin on it before they ever saw the article. So that when it was tended they read it they read it against the spin that you you put 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 on it, uh, and uh, uh, that, that, that was the way I uh, I always acted in in uh, um, opening addresses in, def in defamation, particularly when I was for the plaintiff. Well, I'll, I'll just end with young young Clive. I, I think he probably followed your example in the case that I was in. He, he did exactly exactly that, did a fantastic opening. I thought it was very much like a closing address. And he, he sat down at the end of this brilliant uh, opening. And Mr Mulholland, uh, for the defendant, stood up and said, well, we're wondering if Mr Everett would care to tell us the names of the witnesses he proposes to call. And, um, and Clive Everett turned to me in a very loud voice. The jury could hear. He said, do I have to tell them that? So that was my introduction to, um, to the Sydney opening. Um, <laughs> Normally up here we, we tell the uh, jury or the judge the witnesses they're supposed to uh, hear from, but that was um, uh, a, a terrific experience for, for me. We've covered a lot of ground uh, this evening in, in the decades of Michael McHugh's case book. We're very sorry that Professor Rolf is not here, but I bought his book to court uh, as a token uh, to mark his uh, absence. May I say what a privilege and a pleasure it's been to be uh, on the stage uh, with Mr McHugh, even though we're in different uh, cities. Uh, I'd like to thank him for his massive contribution to the law uh, across all uh, fields and for his thoughtful comments and preparation for tonight in providing some uh, invaluable oral history uh, about defamation law. And uh, the Honourable uh, Alan Robinson, President of the Australian Academy of Law, is with Mr McHugh in Sydney. And uh, Mr Robinson will formally thank uh, Mr McHugh. Well, thank you, uh, Justice Peter Applegarth. It's my privilege to move the vote of thanks. We've enjoyed, I think you'll agree, uh, a fascinating discussion between Mr Michael McHugh and Justice Applegarth, uh, I hope you agree it's been a most interesting event. I want to thank a number of people, 
Uh, first of all, uh, I thank Chief Justice Boscoe for chairing the event and indeed for making the splendid uh, Banco Court in Brisbane available uh, for this event. Uh, I'd also thank Chief Justice Mortar of, of the Federal Court for making this courtroom uh, available. My special thanks to Justice Peter Applegarth who conceived uh, of the idea for this event and has uh, steered it through and done a tremendous amount of uh, work in uh, bringing it to such, such a successful uh, conclusion. Also, of course, uh, uh, our thanks, all, uh, all of our thanks to our special guest, Mr. Uh, Michael McHugh. Uh, I thank the Selden Society for co-sponsoring the event. Uh, I thank also the Supreme Court Library of Queensland for their work and the uh, technical uh, support uh, behind the scenes which has made this uh, uh, joint event uh, uh, possible. So uh, please join me uh, again in thanking our speakers uh, and in particular our special guest Mr McHugh and I have a small uh, present to give to him as a token of our thanks. <laughs> My thanks to everybody for the enormous effort involved in putting together um, this event, which has been um, just a wonderful way to learn um, about uh, the past uh, and the, uh, the more recent um, developments in the law, which of course informs where things will go in the future. Thank you everyone who's here in person. Thank you to everybody who's there in Sydney. We're, we're sorry that we can't um, meet together with you tonight. But everyone who's here is very welcome to stay and join us for refreshments uh, in the portrait gallery outside. And for those who haven't um, been there in recent times, you'll see a reshuffling of portraits and one very new one. Um, so thank you very much again and good evening um, to you, Mr McHugh and Mr Robertson. <laughs>